The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. So, next system we're going to look at with the same uh, point of view is NLS. And NLS uh, is short for the online system, it was introduced or rather presented by uh, Doug Engelbart in 1968. Uh, this was a system um, that was inspired by, among other things, the, the MIMICS, you know, the, the system that we saw by Van der Bosch um, that was supposed to enhance the ability of humans to work as knowledge workers, as the term said. It was also inspired by the, the SAGE real-time interaction system that we saw earlier, um, and of course by general computer systems at the time. Um, if you want to find a video of this, uh, of this demonstration, uh, the Google search term you need is mother of all demos, because this is such an inspiring and, and influential demonstration um, that was given by the system here by Doug Engelbart in 68 um, that people have kept referring to it ever since. The cool thing that he did in his, in his demonstration um, is that he actually used the system live and used it to talk about what he was doing. So he was showing it to people in a live usage rather than you know, giving a presentation about it. Um, some of the things that we'll see in the NLS video um, are word processing and linking. Um, we will actually also, and this is what Doug Engelbart is most known for, uh, we will also see the first example of the mouse. Um, so this was something that he introduced. Um, you know, but the principle of windows, splitting screens into multiple content areas, hyperlinks between content, uh, even video conferencing to other remote locations, uh, revision control of documents, word processing uh, in a collaborative real-time editor, um, all those things were being demonstrated there. The real focus here was not so much creating a system that you, know, you and I could just pick up and use from day one. It was really focusing on um, expert knowledge workers who had time to learn a system and become very proficient at it. Uh, that's why it also failed in many user tests because it was very complex to use. Um, somebody once said that you know it's perfect for a trained user if you have four hands because it was so uh, rich in, in what it was able to do that it, uh, you know, it asked too much of some of the people who were trying to operate it. Uh, I think the um, You know, the example, I think, stands because uh, what, what Engelbart said, uh, I think it was interviewed in, when was this, 2004, uh, by Nerd TV, and, and he said, well, a computer uh, that's easy to learn is like a bike. It's easy, but um, the bike also, already also has limitations, right? It doesn't take you that far. And his vision was that, you know, um, learning complex technology is more important if it can really push people uh, to enhance their capabilities. Um, Engelbart was born in 1920, 1925. He died um, in July 2013. Um, and uh, so this, this is basically his legacy. Um, this is, for example, the picture of, of the mouse that um, Engelbart designed here. Uh, that picture I was able to take actually um, myself when I had a chance at Stanford to um, see Doug Engelbart, Engelbart give a talk on his, on his system and pick up his cool mouse design here. So. Uh, this slightly damaged wooden box here was what was left of the first um, mouse. Um, the design of the mouse is maybe also interesting. It actually had two uh, metal wheels, uh, one going this way and the other one going that way. Um, and so when you rolled it one way, one wheel would be turning, the other one would be scraping across. Uh, and when you pulled it diagonally, both would kind of semi-scrape, semi-roll. Uh, not a perfect design. Uh, the later ball design was much, much better, of course. Um, and, uh, but, but it was uh, definitely an interesting design. Also, as you can see, the initial mouse only had a single button. That's how it started out. And then you know, the whole discussion started of how many buttons should we have on a mouse. Um, they found, however, that um, the mouse was faster to um, acquire a target than any other pointing device. You know, trying it in the following way, you get your hands on the keyboard, um, they had an array of three by three objects on the screen and they made people press the space bar, then grab the pointing device, whatever it was, and try to click on each object. So they did a little actual user, uh, user study uh, to determine which one was the fastest uh, device. And the mouse definitely uh, won here, uh, given you know, these other options here, light pen, trackball, 
foot pedal, knee operated devices, even head operated devices. I don't know what these look like in detail, but um, interesting study. So let's take a look at the mother of all demos here. So I'm putting in an entity called a statement. Hi, Bill. That's great. Now we're connected audio. You can see my work. You can point at it, and I can see your face, and we can talk. OK, so I think uh, that was quite a list of, of things that you may uh, know from today. So we've seen, of course, uh, the linking of stuff, of text uh, to each other, you know, going from a definition, uh, from a word to its definition, going to a graphical picture of the mouse, for example, when you click on the word mouse, like what is that? You get a little sketch shown to you. So that's hyperlinks to, to you know, multimedia content, essentially. Um, we also saw the ability of, of splitting windows um, to show both like you know overview and, and, and detail at the same time, but also sort of a version of Skype 0.1, I guess, and Google Docs 0.1, where you were both sharing a document, editing it together over uh, the internet, and uh, also having the ability to video conference. Now, some of these things um, were, as he called it, done with people aid, so he had analog, an analog video team standing by between Menlo Park and, and his demonstration, which I think was in San Francisco. Um, and, and so they were basically uh, you know, faking the digital video uh, conferencing there. Uh, but the shared document, of course, was, was, was also happening. So I think this is a, is a very inspiring um, demonstration, and I encourage you to take a look at the, the full video. It's kind of hard to get all the things that are happening here, because they're really just cut together um, very, very rapidly. So, uh, the whole demo is a bit longer. It gives you more of a chance to actually understand what he's talking about. Um, what I think is um, also important is to see that the input devices, the mouse was introduced. And you may have noticed, did you notice anything weird about the mouse other than um, you know, the fact that it had these strange wheels there? Anything strike you about, yeah? I assume you can only move it in one direction at a time because there are two wheels and not like a ball like you had until some years ago. So, yeah, when you look at the video, you'll see that he does actually do a sort of figure eight. So it does work on a diagonal because both wheels kind of semi-scrape, semi-slide, semi-roll uh, across the surface. Not as, you know, sort of precisely probably as you would get it with a ball or, or today with optical mice, uh, but you were able to do that, yeah. But there was something else that was maybe a little unusual about the mouse from today's point of view. The, the cable was on the back side. Yeah, the cable came out sort of towards the, the edge of the table. You may have noticed that, right? So at some point, somebody then figured out, hmm, it might be a good idea to get that cable out of the way. And it started coming out of the other end. But the early mice um, had their cable coming towards the, towards the user. OK. so. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting about input device-wise is the, uh, the cording keyboard that you saw, right? These five unlabeled keys uh, that you can use to create all sorts of characters by pressing a combination of keys at the same time. Um, and that is the example of um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the keyboard here in a picture. Uh, so you know, if you wanted to get an A, you press just a, this key. B is this one. C is this. You can see basically it's a binary code. Uh, that, you know, pretty much at least, uh, that encodes what you need to press to get each letter. Um, very complex, of course, um, but it is actually more efficient for, for editing and manipulating text together with a mouse than uh, the normal keyboard, because you can use your left hand on the keyboard and your right hand on the mouse and can be very quick about uh, working with text and, um, and, and a mouse at the same time. Yeah? He has a keyboard as well in the middle. <coughs> he does, right. So, his normal text typing, when he was basically just typing a lot of text, like his list of shopping items, he would do that on the alphanumerical one. The quarter key, what you would mostly use to uh, trigger commands that requires you to, for example, point at some text and say copy, paste to somewhere else. So mostly for um, command like uh, button presses, basically, not so much for main text input. So yeah, it's a good observation. It was, uh, both things were wrong. So for plain text entry, uh, the QWERTY keyboard is faster and, and is more, more efficient. But if you have to also control the cursor, then it takes a lot of time moving from the keyboard to the mouse, back to the keyboard, back to the mouse. This is time that you waste and that you don't waste if you have both hands basically busy all the time.
This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.